Hello everybody. So you have been working with your curriculum guides and you have looked at the objectives and planned out your objectives based upon the blueprint for the state. You have uh, also uh, looked at prerequisites so what you would need and we're going to move that to the next step here dealing with assessments. But before we get there, I wanted to share some common thoughts with you that we see dealing with curriculum. These are some things that uh, you guys kind of talked about in some of your discussions and some that others have talked about in um, previous classes. So I just want to run through these real quickly with you. The first thing we see here is this micro versus macro curriculum. And uh, the person who initially talked about this at the beginning of a previous class talked about the micro curriculum being that which the school uses and the macro curriculum being the larger uh, curriculum maybe a district or even the state uses so one of the things that you've already learned through uh, reading Steffi uh, or Downey I mean is this alignment that needs to be there that all three curriculum need to be in place and this deep alignment needs to be present. Now we're going to talk, you're going to hear me refer to deep alignment. We're really not touching on deep alignment in this course. That's really a curriculum two course, but uh, certainly there really is no separate micro macro curriculum. They're really all in the same once they're aligned. Uh, so the next thing we hear is teaching to the test and in your readings we have talked about this concept of teaching to the test and you know I have to say that um, that uh, you, you've got to do it uh, so initially that sounds harsh that sounds like we're taking away freedom of teachers and so forth but in the discussion boards I've talked about the importance of standards and how we can use standards uh, to guide what we're doing and how we should use them. There should be a standard out there to which we're aiming to achieve. I want you to start thinking of the standards as being the minimum of what students should learn in your course, not the ultimate. And even that little change in mindset will change the way you work, but teaching to the test then becomes a minimum as well. And a prime example here would be, uh, let's say I hired a teacher who was from New England and she's going to teach social studies for me and I need her to teach high school history and she has all this uh, knowledge about the Revolutionary War because she grew up around Boston and went through New York and all the areas up there and so she wants to teach a revolutionary war. She may be an expert in that, but that is not part of the high school curriculum. And so in that sense, I have to tell her, you have to teach to the test. In other words, you have to teach the minimum curriculum that is, on the, that is a part of the tested curriculum. Uh, it would be pointless for her to teach about the revolutionary war for a semester even though she could probably do an excellent job at it because the students aren't going to be tested on that. This might be something you could do afterwards uh, that last month, those last 20 days of class or maybe um, uh, you know a couple of days reviewing at the beginning of class. But So teaching to the test is, is something that people say I've come to learn when they just don't know what to do and so that's a, a defense mechanism they throw up. Everyday math, uh, this is an example of the taught curriculum. Uh, I put that in here because I want you to see that the taught curriculum uh, has to be aligned and people that sell everyday math and any other program are going to tell you, oh yeah this is aligned to the Oklahoma standards or the TEKS in Texas, uh, or whatever standards you're, you're working with, but you as a teacher have to be able to look and make sure that that alignment is there 
with the tested curriculum and that it fits in with your written curriculum so that what you actually give in the taught curriculum, deliver to the students, uh, is aligned to the other two and that that alignment is still there. The Hunter model, this is probably what a lot of us used when we um, started teaching. This is what I used when I started teaching. Um, and this works. Uh, this is a good model for the uh, taught curriculum. Uh, there are some things in here that once we go through the curriculum guides, you're going to see that there are some things lacking in the Hunter model that, that we could add. Uh, so anyway, that's just a few of these. Um, extracurricular activities are important. Um, the nature of the learner, the role of accountability, the purpose of education. All these things have been discussions brought up in the past. but uh, We're not going to go through all of them, but uh, hopefully you can see how uh, really what comes out when I ask that question, what is curriculum? Everybody has a small piece of it. And it's not until we start bringing it all together and looking at it that we start seeing that model that Downey talked about, that triad of the written, taught, and tested curriculum. So what we're going to look at here deals with um, assessment. This is the next piece you're going to add to your uh, curriculum guides. So for each unit you have identified, you now have a major objective for the unit. You have prerequisites necessary to begin the unit. And now you're going to add assessments. What kinds of assessments will you use uh, with your students? And if your district uses common formative assessments, benchmarks in other words, uh, then you can put down there CFA, Common Formative Assessment, or Benchmark 1, or whatever you want to call it. You can put that in there, okay? Um, again, the deep alignment piece would talk about off and on. Uh, that is definitely a part of assessments. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in our readings uh, that we're doing with English and Steffi. Um, but... Uh, the assessment is the next piece, okay? So, um, in, in class, we would have talked about uh, looking at your curriculum guides uh, in general. Um, but what I want to do instead of doing this in class is look at the um, criteria that you should use for your curriculum guide. So, looking at your objectives, okay, rating it a 0 through a 3, uh, obviously you're going to have some objective in there, so it's not going to be a zero, because I, I told you to divide it up into units and to put an objective into each one. Uh, so really what we're looking at is one and twos here probably, uh, but be, be cognizant of what it takes to get to that uh, rating of a two and possibly a three. Uh, so that three for each objective, the what, when, and how the actual standard is performed and the amount of time spent learning it. Okay. For your prerequisites, here are the criteria uh, ratings for that. A zero would be that you did not mention any prerequisite skills. A one, prior general experience needed. A two, and this is really where you differentiate here is that you state that prior experience needed and then specify a grade level. Okay, so maybe if you're teaching high school history, it was eighth grade history because that was the last time they'd studied history. Um, maybe in high school history, you're going to do a little bit with the West, and because you've done some uh, curriculum work in your, in your school, you know that students in Oklahoma history also talked about the West, so maybe you can refer to a prerequisite skill is knowledge about the West from ninth grade Oklahoma history, that kind of stuff. And then obviously a three uh, would mean that you state the specific prerequisite uh, or description of the skills or concepts required prior to the learning, um, and that may appear in your scope and sequence. Okay. So now we're going to talk about assessment. So I want to 
first of all, ask an important question here, and we, we hit on this already, and that is why do we assess our students? Um, normally the answer here, uh, without much thinking, is to see what the students have learned, or to see if they learned enough uh, to, to master the content. But I want you to, to clear your mind of that, and I want to give you a new definition of assessment. Okay, and here, I, I want you to think of assessment from now on, not to see what the students learned, but we assess them to see if we delivered the material effectively to them. So if I have a class and I give them uh, a, a written assignment, and I grade them on grammar and uh, flow and syntax and all the stuff that goes into to writing, a thesis statement, supporting paragraphs, this good five paragraph theme format, uh, which might be something I would do in a history class uh, very easily. If I see that the majority of students failed on many of those things, then it's not that they failed, it's that I didn't teach them, I assumed that they knew how to do these things. And so maybe even as a history teacher, I'm going to have to take uh, a 30 minute lesson and go quickly review structures of writing. Okay, That's why we assess students, to see if we delivered instruction effectively. And if we find that we didn't, we have to go back and reteach. So that's the next question. What do we... Uh, use as assessments then. So here's where, you, where you're putting in your, your assessments in your uh, paper. How often should we use common assessments? What should that be if we use one? You know, uh, your, your assessments are going to be maybe a chapter quiz uh, that you take from the book. Whatever it is, at this point just put in some type of assessment. But keep in mind as you're putting this assessment in, the, the goal of the assessment is to see if you delivered the instruction effectively. Now, if we were to extend that out even further, uh, not only is it you delivering instruction, but it's also students in their, uh, if they're uh, getting help from specific programs, okay? So earlier we talked about uh, Math 180 or, or something like that. Uh, or is uh, everyday math then, yeah that's a program if we see that our students are still failing after being exposed to everyday math for a year then if, if they're failing as far as the assessments go then we have to ask ourselves two questions now number one did we deliver the instruction effectively and number two if we're using everyday math is the program aligned effectively to, to what is being tested. So again, you see that, that program alignment uh, is important in the taught, written, and tested curriculum. Uh, if we have, um, oh, let's say we have an honors program that we're, we're putting money into to train teachers, to uh, teach students, and uh, these students are going through a, a pre-AP class as part of their honors program or something. And we find that there's no difference between students who go through the honors program and students who do not when it comes to the AP exam. Then we have to question that program because apparently that program is not having an impact on student achievement as measured by the AP exam in that example. So that's what we mean by assessments, okay, and how I want you to start thinking of assessments. Uh, so here are the criteria that we will use to deal with assessments. In each of your units, I want you to put some assessments. Again, it can be chapter quizzes, uh, it might be a unit quiz, it might be, you know, whatever you're doing. Uh, I want you to put it in there, if it's an common formative assessment. I want you to identify that. Ultimately, at the end, you would put the summative assessment. Uh, 
if it's a tested area such as uh, third through eighth grade ELA or math, then you would put the state uh, CRT down as your summative assessment at the end of the course. Uh, and so again, now you're getting an idea. We can look back at those assessment results and if we see that students are not performing well in the state test, then that means that somewhere in our program there's a misalignment of the written, taught, and tested curriculum. And so you're, you're getting the idea of how we can go back and start looking at these things. So when it comes to assessment, here are the criterion ratings. Zero, no assessment approach. A one, there's some assessment approach stated. Number two, the skills, the knowledge, and concepts that will be assessed are stated. And then number three, you key each objective to the district or state performance uh, assessment. So each objective then will be identified on a district or a state performance assessment, you know. So if objective one is the um, post-reconstruction America, uh, you know, we're going to uh, assess this on CFA 1 and the state EOI, that would be a 3, tying that specific objective to the assessments. We're also going to use uh, chapter uh, quiz from chapter, you know, 10 and 11 or whatever that sense. So you're tying them to specific assessments that you're going to do and use with those students. So I think achieving a three on assessments is going to be a little bit easier for everybody than some of the other areas. Uh, but again, that will be the next column you will add to your curriculum guides is assessments for each of your units.